गुड आफ्टरनून मैम गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी गुड आफ्टरनून मैम गुड आफ्टरनून मैम गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी आई जस्ट मैक अन मैम गुड आफ्टरनून uh i'll be taking for you mg01 and mg01 is british poetry uh how many of you have had english honors in your ba level can you just uh, uh raise hands mm okay 1 2 3 4 5 19 more okay 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 then okay hmm. so you must be having an idea of english literature grammar and uh, ages of english poetry so and this is a very you know this is called counseling in, in distance learning i am supposed to be a counselor not a regular teacher like each and every line i have to go up because there is no time i am just given one hour so in my class as this is the first class i am not insisting but you are supposed to like read you have to read before just to have an idea and then come to have my class because if i go on telling and i can ex explain all the poems it will take you know many more classes and i have been given eight classes to you and you are having uh, 10 blocks so 10 blocks i have to cover in eight classes right so in okay. such in such a thing you know you have to cooperate and uh, one more extra class i might ask for a like a uh, uh, problem solving or some extra questions you have a discussion some I, if i get time i can allot one class for that but that is not in my schedule now in my schedule i have just got eight classes so today i am going to start this mg01 and this is british poetry and today i intend to cover two blocks two blocks block 1 and block 2 so block 1 is more an introductory you know and there is nothing much because we have to prepare according to the questions because if i go on explaining and you go on understanding i uh, you know that will be an endless uh, thing happening and uh, you cannot complete the course so you have to be more uh comprehensive you have to be more practical and you have to um prepare according to the questions uh, that is coming in your examinations like you have short question you have one compulsory question then you have some long questions and in the many blocks there are many mm, units so you have an option like in in, in examination i find uh you are given one compulsory question that is number one question that is a compulsory question which comes and then the rest you are given some options like you are given like uh, maybe eight questions and uh, out of that you have to answer four more that means total you have to answer five questions right so for this five questions certain difficult chapters if you find you can Uh, you are very good and you want to be very thorough in certain chapters you can be thorough so that any question comes in the chapter you can answer those questions and some chapters like milton and all it is very difficult so i i don't know i'm not very sure that um, uh, within this uh, limited time you can understand john milton of course but yes you have to be ready for certain short, short questions so if you are not ready with this long question be prepared that there is some short question that might come which you can answer from that chapter right so good that afternoon. good afternoon please switch off your this thing mic please switch off your audio yeah so you have to be you know you have to be very practical and you have to comprehensively think like uh, all these chapters if you can read well and good i would appreciate but within this limited time if you find that it would be difficult for you so focus if the chapters long chapters which you find you are very difficult it will not be very difficult for i mean it would be difficult for you to answer the long questions and it is not understandable by you so be prepared to have some short questions so that any short question comes from that you can prepare and i would advise you 
just go through the question papers of the last three years, both the sessions, both July session as well as the Jan session. They have the examination. So you have to um, July and uh, I think two sessions. No, you have in July and December, right? So be prepared and you see the question papers of those two sessions of the last three years. Then you can have a fair idea uh, how the questions are coming and what all you, if you are confident, what all you can write on that. For example, some age like romantic age or you say Victorian age, I'm very confident that any question comes, I can write on that. Because literature is a very vast thing and there are many authors, many poets, many prose writers. So it is very difficult. I don't think it could be because in, in the short uh, spell of time and especially my limited time, I, can, I, I cannot do justice to all the poets and to all the writers. I'm, let me be very frank with you. So certain things which you can omit and you find it is difficult. But yes, some certain sort of questions, I will hint at it. You have to mark those. Yes, on those questions, like the questions might come. So be prepared that you can write such certain short notes on that. And certain questions which you are very confident, a romantic age, you're very confident. Any question comes in Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, Byron, I can write on that. So you are very confident in romantic age. Or you can say, I'm very confident in the um, Victorian age, the Matthew Arnold and other writers, or in the modern age, Satyas Eliot and other writers. So you have to be you know, very thorough in at least one or two ages. Because there are different, different age in English, like history, we have different, different ages in English poetry also. So you have to be very confident in one, at least three ages, so that any question comes on this age, you can write on that. And the rest, if you find it a little difficult and you're not able to give that much of time and you're not able to understand and they're little obscure poems. So in such thing, in such a situation, you can be ready to attempt certain short questions which comes from that. Did you get me? So I am giving a very practical yes, assessment ma'am. of how one should prepare as a student of distance learning. Because you are not regular student that I come and meet you every day. And I can give you three hours, four hours of my time to you to explain. But that you are that is unfortunate on my part. And also it's unfortunate on your part that you are not getting that much of time. So with this limited time, you have to assess. You have to be practical. You have to be find out like how, how best I can answer the questions. So what all I should attempt. So that is the reason I'm telling you, be prepared with three years question papers. First, you have to select that is available on the website of IGNO. You can get them. So be ready with that. Paper wise you go. Three years question paper, both the sessions, you can keep them and just see what is the pattern of the questions that is coming. Out of that, you can have a fair idea like what if I prepare this, I'm confident I can write on this. Or if I prepare that, I can prepare this. You know, this you can have a fair. You can yourself assess the situation and then you can start preparing. So today, this is an introduction class. So um, the, the first introductory pages like in the block one, I'm going by block wise. It is about a general, you know, at first it has given all these portraits and all it doesn't, doesn't have any meaning to explain all that. So now I come to prelude to the study of poetry. So poetry, you know, how to understand poetry? What are the basics to learn to understand poetry? For example, in examination, you always have a question, write a critical summary of this poem. So what critical is written on that? It is not simple, write a summary. Write a summary will come only for class six, class seven students, write a summary. They'll explain that briefly the summary. But when it is MA or post-graduation, the word critical is written before that because you have to critically, critically analyze the poem. So what is this critically analyzed? Critical means you have to first understand both ways, both the stylistic aspect as well as the thematic aspect. You have to understand the theme of the poet. What is the thought underlying the poem? What is the age of that poem? I mean, in what age the poem is written so that what are the influences on the poet? Because if I belong to the modern era, like I am belonging to the modern, postmodern era. I will not write something which is, you know, very fanciful or something which is, you know, extraordinarily romantic. No, 
rather i'll be realistic because this is the world around me this is the age of questioning this is the age of technology so i'll not write something which will not appeal to the people so i'll write something which will appeal the people something very diagnostic something which has happened to analyze that 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 you know that carries a meaning similarly every age has got an impact on the poet or even on the poem so to understand poem you have to understand two things one you have to understand the theme of the poem and also you understand the style of the poem so when it comes to style understand the theme means for that you have to understand what is the age of the poet i mean not the uh, real age i mean the, to which age which historical age the poet belongs to right and you have to write what is the stylistic aspect so what is the stylistic stylistic aspect is very important because that is where the versification the grammar of poetry is involved you have to understand the grammar of poetry so those students who have not done english uh, ba english it would be a little difficult for you because this is the technical side of their poem so you must have heard about rhetoric and prosody anyone who can tell me what is called anyone one of you should raise the hand a uh, switch on their camera and tell me what is rhetoric and what is prosody any idea about rhetoric and have you heard such words yes please uh, switch on your audio pranjal uh, ma'am i don't have an idea about rhetoric but prosody is i think the grammar which deals with the basic structure of the verse yeah in a poem yeah the, the structure of the verse that is called switch off that is the called the, the that is called the prosody prosody is the it, there are certain laws you know which govern the structure and that is called the prosody but on prosody when it comes to prosody then you can say certain things are involved in that which comes under that one is the prosody part which allows the uh, which i mean the uh, what is the rhythm what is the meter everything included is called the prosody and rhetoric when you call the rhetoric it is usually the what musical effect the poem has you know that is a rhythm the rhythm of the that is called the prose rhetoric of the poem rhetoric so in ma in your uh, pg level you have scansion you know there is called a particular scan so as we dissect a human body you know you have to dissect a human body like a hand your head your tummy all this no? similarly a poem is also dissected so how the poem is dissected to understand a poem you have to understand the meter of the poem i mean the the feet of the poem every poem has got feet i mean feet means where what is the stress and where is the unstress for example if i say appear i am putting the stress appear where i am putting the stress i am putting the stress on p e a r appear i am not appear i am not telling that i am saying appear so when i say appear i mean i'm putting the stress on the letter part of the not that a part but the p a part similarly when i said behold behold i don't say behold i don't say that i said behold so where is the stress it is on the whole part of it and the b is the that when i say behold behold so b is the unstress so all this you know this this when the uh, the meter is there the words are at times stressed and what's them there is a unstressed accordingly the meter of the poem is judged so this is the habit because you have to read a poem when you when you read the poem you put a stress on particular part of the poem particular part of the word and the other part is little unstressed you don't put the equal stress it, it is very rare you have to put a stress on the first part of the word or on the second part of the word or you can put a stress in the uh, second part of the word and the first part is unstressed so accordingly depending on the poem so according to there are meters that is the iambic pentameter which is a very you know very popular in uh, english literature and that is because all these uh, poets most of them they write in iambic pentameter what is this penta penta means high five, five right five so iambic means where the stress one is unstressed 
the other one is stress one is unstress the other one is stress so if the first one for example let me read uh, the monarch the the monarch hears the monarch hears so the i don't say the mon arc hears did i say no i said the monarch mon that the mon is stressed the remains little unstressed the monarch the monarch hears the mon arc hears so the the is unstressed mon is stressed arc is unstressed hears is stressed similarly i say affects affects to nod affects to nod so you see a is not stress affects i'm putting f f effect effect so the stress is on the effect part of it so as a result a part of it little remains unstressed so this is called the unstressed part of it and the latter is the stress part of it so again to nod i don't say to nod i don't say that i said to nod to nod so to becomes unstressed nod becomes stressed so this is usually this is called the meter of the poem so in order in order to, in order to understand the rhetoric and the prosody you have first to understand the meter of the poem so there are uh, you know uh, four types of meter generally it is used one is the iambic pentameter where the first part is unstressed the second part of the word is stressed unstressed stressed unstressed stressed unstressed stressed that is and it is iambic pentameter right and that is the five line of stanza uh, five line uh, iambic pentameter and the next is trochi t r o c h w -E, a trochi where it is just the reverse first the stress then the unstress first the stress then the, it is just the opposite of the iambic for example tiger you don't say tiger do you say tiger no i say tiger tiger so the stress is on the first part of it tiger tiger right tie stress holy you don't say holy holy you don't say you said holy holy the ho is stressed l y is unstressed upper upper when you say upper birth upper first the first part is stressed second part is unstressed upper similarly grandeur grandeur so grandeur the grand is stress your is unstressed right so iambic and trochi so iambic is uh, unstressed stressed and trochi is just the opposite stress and stress and next is anapest anapest but mostly you know you have ambic and trochi most of them write in that only and the other is an anapest a n a p e p a e s t anapest where there are two unstress one stress two unstress one stress two unstress one stress understand you don't say understand you don't say that understand understand so un one der one stand one so here the stand part is stand part is stressed similarly re re up re appear re appear so re is stressed unstressed app is unstressed but e a r is stressed reappear you don't say re up here you don't say that you say reappear reappear so e r is stress so unstressed unstressed stressed this is the anapest next is the dactyl d a c t y l well, it is just the opposite of anapest again the same thing first is the stress second to unstress first is the stress second to unstress in in that anapest it was two first two unstressed then stress first to unstress then stress but dactyl is just the opposite first the stress then to unstress for example desperate he is very desperate 
you don't say disparate 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 so de is stressed dis disparate he is very disparate so des is one word p is one word peret ret is one word so you have to divide this particular word into three three types re disparate disparate one des one per one per one ret one so accordingly the word is divided so besides that you have also major fit you have the spondy the pyrus all these are these are all the technical part of a, you know uh, prosody the rhetoric and prosody which you have to understand and unless you do some exercises you will not get it you have to read the poem you have to read it in a very the way it is written understanding the meaning of the poem then only you will get the sense if if i say tiger tiger burning bright tiger tiger so tie tie stress gar is unstress tiger tiger burning b u e r stress burning bright bright so g h t is not stressed g h t is unstress bright when i say bright bright is stressed so you have to you know you have a habit of reading poems then you know where is the stress and where is the unstress in one day it is very difficult to find out which is the stress even when we were pg students we are really confused what is to be stressed and what is to be not stressed because you know south indian they have a particular way of you know uh, pronouncing pronunciation we have a different way of pronunciation the north indians have a different way of pronunciation so this is a foreign language for us so the way they pronounce you know the read you know the accordingly the accent also goes on changing and the stress also goes on changing so at times it becomes very you know difficult and it is very ambiguous to find out which part of the feet i should stress and which part of the feet i not stress but generally generally uh, you have an idea because simple words like you know where to put the stress and where not to put the stress uh, you you have uh, a fair idea and most of the poems will find it is written in iambic pentameter that is a very popular way, common measure and when any everything is unrhymed what do you call that everything is unrhymed nothing there's no rhyme nothing that is called blank verse that is called blank verse right so even nothing is rhyming one word maybe it's short the other word maybe okay vijay lakshmi okay so one word is stressed one word is there is no no pattern there is no pattern one long line one short line the lines are not matching there is no rhyme scheme so if, if in and that's a modern poetry generally modern poetry is written in blank verse blank verse is also called a free verse where there is no pattern of writing you know it may be long may be short may be rhyme may not rhyme so this is the blank verse but in the earlier century they are very particular the poets you know not like the modern ones modern poets they are not bothered about the meter of the poem but earlier they were to you know very particular about the meter like shakespeare had his own style spencer had his own style chaucer had his own style you know they they were very particular what type of meter they are going to use what should be the rhyme pattern of the poem and they accordingly you know wrote poems um, i mean observing all these rules you know of poetry but nowadays in modern poems you don't have such things you just say that is just generally you know it's a free verse and anything you can write anything that has to have sense that has to have a meaning so this um there long exercises on this there are many poems given uh, with the self check where they are given anapestic meter the dactyl meter and you have to read and find out the stress and the unstress which i have already told you this is the uh rhyme i mean this is the uh, prosody part of it now i'll come about the rhyme rhyme what is this rhyme rhyme means which gives you which is it can you can distinguish uh, poem from prose how come because a prose is something is very lengthy sort of thing it's a very boring sort of thing having no pattern you know but in poem every, it definitely it must be having a pattern it must be having a sense of music 
the choice of words are different and so that that has its style of its own so it has got a rhythm rhythm means it has got a uh, you got to consider the music of the poem has to have there has to be and then there has to be choice of words like alliteration where the consonants are repeated the first consonant is repeated and then at times you have the vowels are repeated that called assonance there are times you know the the music is so strong that even if you don't understand the meaning you can get the meaning so that is called onomatopoeia so that is the again another word for it so these are all the uh, technical words you know to understand the rhyme and rhythm of poetry so huh so in this uh, generally in poetry you'll find odes lyric sonnets right they have got a pattern of their own and when you call of odes we come first the petrarca node then you have uh, spencerian ode then you have kitsis ode so every poet you know in each in each age they developed a style of their own petrarcan how is the petrarcan poem or, or how what is the structure of a petrarcan ode what is the structure of a spencerian ode and then different like also sonnets sonnets has also got a rhyme pattern of its own the shakespearean sonnet the spencerian sonnet so it, it, they have got a rhyme scheme according to the rhyme scheme they write the poem so if i say petrarcan sonnet if i go to petrarcan sonnet first then you know you find sonnet is mostly how many lines can you tell me 14 14 right okay thank you manasi so 14 lines so the first part is called the octave in in the petrarcan and the second part is called the sestet octave is eight lines octave is eight and sestet is six lines so in the octave part one idea is given and the sestet part that idea is elaborated right so wordsworth and keats in romantic age also wrote this petrarcan sonnet so this is developed by petrarch similarly you have a shakespearean sonnet which is in three quatrains what is called a quatrain quatrain means a line a stanza of four lines octave means eight lines okay if it is what quatrain then it is four lines so shakespeare wrote he divided his poems into three quatrains and the two lines they were called a couplet couplet means two lines matching the end part should be matching like it was like uh, the rhyme scheme was for example i'll read out a poem a b a b c d c d e f e f g g a b a b c d c d e f e f g g so this is the experience on it for example uh this is a very famous poem you must have heard for example i am reading the first line let me not to the marriage of true minds so the word last word is minds minds next line admit impediments love is not love so minds and love they don't match right so you can give minds a and you can give love b but when you come to the third line which alters when it alteration finds so finds and minds do they match yes they match they match so it is ab ab got it then another line or bends with the remover to remove so remove is another particular so you give c for that oh no it is an ever fixed mark then you give mark another word d but when you come to the next line again that looks on tempest and is never shaken it is another word that is e it is the star to every wandering bark f so no lines are you find matching but the last two lines 
in the last two lines when I call GG. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. Proved, loved. Proved, loved. Last two words are matching. So they are given GG. So this is how you should read the poem. So Shakespearean sonnet, Petrarchan sonnet, and Spenserian sonnet. Spenserian sonnet is very close to Shakespearean sonnet. But the only thing is in Shakespeare, it is two lines are totally different. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. But in Spenserian, A, B, A, B, and in the next, it is B, C, B, C. But in Shakespearean, it was C, D, C, D, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. But here it is A, B, A, B, then B, C, B, C, then third is C, D, C, D, then E, E. Again, last two lines are called couplet. When the two lines match, last two lines, that is called a couplet, C, O, U, P, L, E, T. So that is the rhyme scheme. You know, they, they all these have a rhyme scheme. Then... Uh, yes, Muskan, what happened? Please switch off the audio, please. Muskan Kumari, please switch off your audio. Don't disturb the class. So these are many self checks are given where you have to do this exercise because if I read out, you will not understand. That is the problem. So you have to read these uh, lines. There are giving exercises in the book. You have to go through that to find out uh, this iambic pentameter, the trochee, uh, dactyl, all these, you know, these are the words which you can maybe in, ex in exams, it must be coming, some lines must be coming. And they may be writing to scansen for find out what is the feet of the line or uh, what is the rhythm of this line. So therefore that you have to understand the Petrarchan sonnet, you have to understand the Shakespearean sonnet, you have to understand the Spenserian sonnet and see how it is, you know, written. So these are the self-check things given. Uh, okay. Huh. So this is the technical part of it, how to understand a poem. Where you, these are all very technical things which you have to know. Then we come to the main part of it. That is the age of Chaucer. Geoffrey. What is this happening? Geoffrey Chaucer. Okay, Frank is okay. So he was called the father of English poetry. And he was the first English poet to be recognized. And he wrote in an English which is called the archaic English, the old English. It's very difficult to understand his uh, lines because it is not, uh, you know, it's written in old English. And, uh, um, and it was in the late Middle Ages, you know, late Middle Ages. So you can say 1340 to 1400 and uh, where the, there was the power of the church. Church was very important during that time and also the landlord of the society. He used to control all the land. So on the one side you had a dual power you can say on one side there was the church and the other side you had the landlord who control all the land. And people were generally very illiterate during that time. There was no literacy. And uh, just wait. And the, and the economy, you can say it was a money economy because before that, that was a very dark age. People didn't understand this. That this is or this middle age was age of a transition, and uh, there was started the growth of trade and commerce has also started. And uh, that was a time, you know, there people had this hundred years war in Europe, 
uh, and the Hundred Years' War was happened because due to uh, the fight between uh, Catholics and uh, Protestants. Who is more important, the Catholics or the Protestants? So these these events, these were the events which had an impact on English poetry. And uh, there was also the peasants' revolt. Revolt. The farmers' revolt was also there because uh, the um, economy was agrarian. I mean, they're mostly agricultural. People was mostly agricultural. So, so this hundred years war was between uh, the England and France. You know, it took place, and uh, finally England had won over France. And uh, when England won over France, then gradually, you know, the England started growing prospering and but at the same time england also had this outburst of bubonic plague plague something you know plague had happened in uh, england but hundreds like we had covid you know many people died similarly there was a very bad epidemic you know in in england where many people died it affected the lives and this epidemic continued in three spells, not only one spell, three spells until the 17th century it had continued, you know. So until the development of the medical science, this disease was not controlled. People used to die of plagues and plague happened due to a particular rat. As this time it happened bat, you know, people said that COVID happened due to bat. Similarly, that time the plague happened due to the due to some some rat so that was something which uh, you know it affected and there was a virus which spread and many people they died when many people died naturally you know there is a shortage of labor in the society when there was a shortage of labor many post lay vacant you know there was no um there's no people to take care of people died and uh, so there was a total political unrest also in the country and uh, as the people did not get their due, there was also a revolt in society. The farmers started revolting. That is the background where Chaucer comes to in a foreground. And, and uh, he started, had he was influenced by the society, he was influenced by the cultural um, side of the happenings. So he was greatly influenced by all this. And he started writing in this old English. So this Chaucerian society, that is called the Chaucerian society. Chaucerian society, you can divide them into three groups. One was, I told you, the noble group with the rich landlords. Second group was the church, where there were the fathers, very, very powerful. And the third was the working class. So the society was divided into these three groups and it was very hierarchical. Hierarchical means everything was controlled by the church. People, they had a lot of power in their hands. So they, they, they monopolized. And the poor people, the working class, they are called the serfs, S-C-R-F-S, serfs. So they, you know, they were large in numbers, but they had no way. So they had to submit one to one side to the nobility to the nobles and the other side they're the church so society you know it was a very fragmented society and there was a very power struggle on one side between um, on, on the one side the nobles the landlords on the other side the church everyone wanted to have power in the hands so the it was a period of rest uh, i mean unrest and um, people also started to make money because it was the war was over and uh, as the war was over so naturally you know they start wanted to have more money they wanted to become prosperous they wanted to become rich overnight so people started making having commerce and trade and uh, this looting was also there and uh, people were ransoming the prisoners and making money out of them so all these things happened in the society the society was a very disturbed society and everything even marriage was uh, negotiated uh, with the purpose of money and the divorce also was very easy wife beating was also there so that was the harsh reality of the society but nothing was very peaceful everything was very disturbed
because on one side there was the bubonic plague, the other side there was the war was over, and then the power had come to England. So everyone wanted wanted to become prosperous. So this is how that was the situation of the country. And also, you know, there was on one side superstition. On the other side, one side we find also the superstition was also there because medical science had not developed. So they believed in pseudoscience. Pseudoscience means they will go first by the horoscope, see the horoscope of the person. Then you'll say whether he has been affected by any spirit or, you know, you had some like uh, there are four humors in our body. Like, you know, in uh, in Uriya, we say bato, pitta. You know, all these things we have in the four Ayurvedic science, they believed in all that. So exactly, you can say the medicine part had not developed so much. And there was more given importance given to dreams. If you see a bad dream, means, oh, something has happened. Then accordingly, you know, they'll do something to prevent that dream. Or they'll say, oh, this person will die. That so there was, on one side, there was superstitious was there. The superstition was there. Pseudoscience had developed. And um, it was not a properly, you know, organized society, you can say. So this is where uh, we find Geoffrey Chaser. And he was the first one uh, who to write uh, a number of poems. And out of that, you can say you have two poems, Canterbury Tales Prologue, because Canterbury Tales is a very famous poem. And it's a very long poem. So you have the prologue to the um, um, Canterbury Tales. And the out of that Canterbury Tales, you have a non priestess tale. There are two tales in your uh, syllabus. Ma'am? Yes. Uh, I, I joined late actually. Which is this poem, ma'am? I'm talking about Geoffrey Chaucer. Geoffrey? Chaucer. C H A U C E. No, no, he's the poet. Geoffrey Chaucer okay, is okay. the poet of the medieval age. And you have two poems. One is the prologue to Canterbury Tales, and the other one is a nun's priestess tell. So these two poems, I did told you, this poet was an archaic poet, means of the old age. So everything is written in an old English. It's not a very refined form of English you'll find. It is written in a very, if you read the lines yourself, it will be very difficult to understand because it is in, in it is in old English. You have old English, new English. In old English, the influence of Latin, the influence of France, French, um latin french all these things spanish it was more and uh, english had not refined so because um, Engl england till that time england did not have its own uh sovereignty or you can say its own autonomy so it had just uh, you know one over the hundred years war so everything was new for that country also and that time the old english has that is called the archaic english that prevent so that and that is where Geoffrey Chaucer, the poet, is called the father of English poetry. Uh, he wrote poems. So he was from a very shoemaker's family. He was appointed as a clerk in the king's, um, king's, uh, you know, in the king's uh, uh, palace, you can say. And uh, he had a very large social circle. And Chaucer was very much influenced by the French poets, the Italian poets. And because English till now, I told you that it, it had not evolved its own uh, English. It had not evolved its own grammar. It had not evolved its own language properly. So that was an age where it had a lot of influences. Classical languages had influences on English. So he was inspired by a very famous poem. You can say the Roman de la Rose. He had read that poem. And... Uh, Mm, the, uh, there are certain poems which he wrote where you can say he was influenced by, generally was influenced by the uh, the Latin and the French poems. And before he wrote Canterbury Tales, he had also written a number of sh short poems also, like the House of Fame, uh, this uh, Roman de la Rose, which was all inspired by all these classical languages. But the first famous poem, which has become very popular and we to, which still holds importance till day to today, that was his Canterbury Tales. Actually, Canterbury Tales is nothing but it is a um, 
collection of 120 tells, where out of 120, you could complete only 24. In that, what will happen? A group of pilgrims from the large uh, cross section of society uh, involving a doctor, a lawyer, a knight, a square, a merchant, a shipman, a prioress, a monk, you know, all this from the different cross sections of society, they come together and they go for a pilgrimage. They go for a pilgrimage. So they come to from all corners of England and they go to visit the shrine of St. Thomas Becket, who was martyred in the Canterbury Cathedral in 1170. So there was a famous uh, saint, he was called St. Thomas, and he was martyred, means he martyred, means he was killed, he died in the cathedral, in the Canterbury Cathedral. Cathedral is a very big church, it is called a cathedral. So he died in that. So they wanted to go to see the shrine. Shrine means that holy place. That is called the holy place of the Christians. So these pilgrims had come from different corners of the society. And they took a voyage. And they wanted to visit that holy shrine. And I told you they were 120. I think 120 people had come. Yes, 120 people had come and they had planned to have 120 tales because while going and coming, they were all tell that some stories. And out of that, he could only complete 24 tales. And out of these 24 tales, you this, this is the prologue. This non priestess tale is there in your course, which is also one of the tales told in that Canterbury tale. You got my point? Did you understand? Ma'am, excuse me, how many people are there all in pilgrimage? There are 124 people, I believe. 120, 124 people were there. And they're supposed to, or everyone was supposed to tell a story, tell a tale. But he could complete only 24 tales. There originally the plan was all the 120 tales, but they could not complete 120. So they, he could, uh, Chaucer has only 24 tales. I can't hear anything actually. No, no, not 30 people. They're from the wide cross section of society. They're more than 120 people, 124 stories, in fact. They were supported. It is very disturbing. I don't know who's talking. It's very disturbing. Okay. So, the, so the, I am telling you it is only 24 tells he could complete. And I told you that they are coming from a uh, wide cross section of England. They are, and they involved many professions. Doctor, nun was there, priest was there, shipman was there, uh, this uh, parson was there, farmer was there, cook was there. And the stories were about what? It's about the real world and also the spiritual world. So it was about the world around them. And it was all narrated. But the tales they told, they're like fragments, you know, they're fragments. It is not a continuous tale, they're the fragments. So in that tale, you can find fragment one, fragment two, fragment three, fragment four, fragment five. <coughs> five fragments. And in fragment one, one is the general prologue, the night's tale, the miller's tale, the reef tale, and the cook tale. And in the fragment two, accordingly in fragment three, you have the wife of Bath's tale. Fragment four, you have the clerk's tale, the merchant's tale. So all these tales were divided into different fragments and they were telling the stories. So what is this prologue? What is the meaning of prologue? Prologue means an introduction. Generally, the meaning of a prologue is once you um, start something, when you read a particular you know book, you'll find it is in prologue or you'll find foreword. That means the entire summary, or you can say the entire overview of that book is given in that first section, <coughs> that is the prologue, or you can say it is an introduction to that.
so this uh, it is like a portrait you know all these people when they tell the stories hey pani puja ka hello so all this portrait it's like a portrait you know if you just uh, uh, listen start listening to all these stories you will find from different corners of the society they have different tales to tell a nun will tell his her own tale the knight will tell his own tale the um, the farmer will tell his own tale so different tales coming and it is all about the real world around them so these stories are not simple you know fantastic stories or you can say the stories are very romantic stories but it is something which is also talks about the real world around them and that time the world around in in during the chaucer time was a very you know uh, it was not a very organized world it was a very disorganized world because it was just the aftermath of war and um, there were a lot of loss of life due to this plague and all so everything was very disorganized in the society and there was a lot of corruption also happening in the society so there's nothing orderly in that as a result you know the stories also relate to all that so this is generally you will find a short story come short note coming on the uh, prologue of the uh, canterbury tales generally on that you will find so next is the language part of it what is the language he used he used the uh, he, the, the language he the verse uh, he used in the canterbury tales is is that of it was a mixture you can see at times you will find the blank verse at times you will find the iambic pentameter at times you will find the heroic couplet so it was all a you know varied style he used in that um, in that uh, in that um, canterbury tales and you can say the canterbury tales it gives a very beautiful you know a very a, a realistic picture of how man is related to his environment so there is also a sense of irony in his poem it was not just it, it was not simple a narrative he was also ridiculing the social evils the the vicious characters and at time the satire <coughs> you know satire satire is an attack satire means a literary attack is called a satire when i'm when i'm criticizing someone that is called that is a style for that and that is called satire and irony is something which is satire is there but it is very subdued it is in a very soft way it is written in a, it is not very direct it is very indirect way when the <coughs> when you are ridiculing someone when you are criticizing someone then there is a sense of irony in that means you say something but the meaning is something different but in satire there is a direct attack though about that man and it is ridiculous directly about the society so he uses both he that uh, he has an attack on the society it talks about very sarcastically about all this so you find like a portrait like a portrait you will find many people coming many people telling the stories and when you talk when you to, to tell the knight is telling the story knight means k n i g h t knight is supposed to be a soldier and he is supposed to have all the brave qualities like a soldier you know of like air force or like army but you know he was you, you find the knight there in chaucer's knight will find a very quiet set of person he is not exactly like a knight he is a very subdued set of person and he is more like a girlish girl girl you know so he is he criticizes uh, that knight in a way so um, uh, similarly if when he talk the wife of bath she talks uh, very openly about her extramarital life she talks about she has a sense of pride that you know she can attract men in her own life so that is also directly given so all these things you know these all these characters they they what they say is about uh, the the life they see around them and when you find the clerk you'll find that uh, the clerk is also having a trying to have a career in the church he is having so he is very unworldly he is poor so he is unworldly and uh, he is, doesn't want to become uh, he doesn't want to have a career in the church because he respects the church but he is poor so as he is poor he wants to have a job that is how he comes to the church so 
this is all the characters and the plowman and the um, plowman is that one that was a farmer um he has also how he is fearful of the upper class and how he is a very rustic fellow and how he uh, carries loads of dung and he digs and make ditch, uh, ditches and um, how he is you know uh, he was always willing to be for labor how people are getting making him exploited <clears throat> so and you find the miller the miller is a clothes man but for him the clothes are not important he has got a very red bushy beard flat nose with a wart so all these you know you'll find very funny funny characters coming in his uh, prologue and the canterbury tales and uh, finally what happened that uh, you instead of i told you 124 stories you have you have only 20 stories and out of them 24 stories you can say but out of them four remains incomplete so you find first is the general prologue i tell you the introduction then the rest part is the tales which they 24 tales 20 tales the tale and then the third part is the talk on the road and when they go on you know on that uh, go on a pilgrimage they just talk they they talk they start talking and in the talking they also have quarrels they have disputes they have confessions so all these things happening uh, in the talk on the road the and there is a host there is one the host the main person who who dominates over the other pilgrims pilgrims persons and he's the one he 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 has tries to reconcile the people because they have lot of disputes so this is the age old war of sexes you know every in every age you will find a war happening among the sexes sexes mean the gender the male and the female so that also happened and there's lot of confession also so this is the this is about the pro canterbury tales usually you have a question on this canterbury the prologue of the canterbury tales where you can tell about the canterbury tales how he was chaucer belonged to that age where you know it is very disturbed society and how he had planned those stories out of that how much he completed and they were in different fragments and out of that is one non pristis tale is very famous and that is the language of the poem you can also write so briefly you can write an overview on that then we come to the non pristis tale so this is a story told by the prist non pristis tale n o n e n o w n e where it is like a comedy this is a like a merry tale m e r r y merry tale the story is about a cock okay cock means you can say male kukuda they are called male kukuda cock cock and the female part is the hen cock hen so the, the this uh, this is a story of a cock cock means his name is chonticleer his name is chonticleer he is a cock and he has got four wives four hens he has got and out of the four hens the principal lady that name is pertelote pertelote she is the main lady main hen so it is a story of how chonticleer is befooled by the fox the fox mean the fox when he sees the fox is the chanticleer going along with his wives he wants to eat that cock the fox <coughs> so he makes a plan so he goes to chanticleer and he says chanticleer you have got a wonderful voice why don't you sing a song you know fox are very intelligent characters you know so chanticleer starts he takes he keeps one leg you know lifts up one leg closes his eyes and starts singing as he starts singing the hen catches that that uh, that, uh, that uh, sorry the fox gets hold of that uh, cock the chanticleer and he wants to eat him up but chanticleer at the same time though he is a very romantic character having four wives enjoying life but still he is very intelligent he says that i want to sing you another song you like my song so why don't you allow me to sing another song so the fox is carried away 
So the fox says, okay, you sing another song and he releases Chanticleer. Once he releases Chanticleer, Chanticleer goes up the goes up to the tree and doesn't come down. So the, the fox tries to fool the cock, Chanticleer, but at the same time, Chanticleer is so intelligent that he befools the fox. So this is the story of non tell. So it is a very mock heroic poem. I mean, it is a comedy. It is a comedy. How the cock saves himself from tragic end by befooling the fox. The fox had tried to trap him. I tried to I who doing Chanticleer. But Chanticleer proves cleverer than the fox because he was intelligent. So he also makes his own plan and finally he saves himself. So Chanticleer is not brave, but he is witty. So here he wants to say that, Chaucer wants to say that in the real world, wit has a role to play. If you are witty, you can win over the evil also. So he could win over because he was intelligent. So this is the this is like an allegory as you have the Panchatantra tells, you know, with a moral. Similarly, this non priestess tell also has a moral that more important is the more important in life is how you can save is not that only if you are brave. John Tickler was not brave. Fox was more powerful than the cock. But Chanticleer was witty. And at the same time, Chanticleer was a very social person, social hen, cock, because he had a beautiful understanding with his wives and he was enjoying his life merrily. So this is a, you can say, a mock heroic poem. Not exactly heroic, but a mock heroic poem. So you can say this, uh, it, it talks about, though it is story of Chanticleer, but it talks about the human instinct. You, you talk about in human, in, we have seven deadly sins, you know, you have le greed, you have lechery, you have revenge, all the seven deadly sins. Amakondi Satta Dwara Satta seven, seven sins you have also. So he talks about the seven deadly sins but and it is the finally it is like the human instinct he talks about the human instinct but what finally prevails what finally prevails is your 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 intelligence your moral your wit <coughs> where finally uh, you know the chanticleer could win over that fox was a very mean character and wanted to kill the cock. So you can find there is a sense of irony here also. The fox and the cock both outwit each other. They try to, you know, use their own wit. And the cock finally, just through his wit, he saves himself from a tragic end. You must have heard the story of the monkey and the crocodile where the crocodile eats the one who eats the monkey and when he's in the <coughs> midst of the ocean he says the tells the monkey that you know i am taking you to my house today because my wife says that the monkey is eating berries every day so his heart must be very tasty so we want to cook him up and we can eat him up and he was in the midst of the ocean so monkey is intelligent so monkey said, oh, you should, be, you should have told me. You are my friend. If you are want to eat my heart, then you should have told me. Because whenever I come out, I keep the heart on the, on the tree. So only if, you, if I bring my heart, your wife will eat. So I have not brought my heart. I have kept it on the tree. Then the crocodile says, okay. Then, oh, it's a very small thing your wife has asked. Just to eat my heart, it is nothing. She can eat me up. But I have not brought my heart along with me. So I have kept it on the branch of the tree. So if you take me to the shore, I'll take me, bring my heart and then both of us can go. So the crocodile was a big fool. 
So the crocodile said, okay, and he took him along to the tree. So when he went near the tree, the monkey jumped to the tree and he said, you are not my friend. You are, you are worse than a friend. In the name of friend, you want to eat me up. So from today, I have no friendship with you. So this is the moral of the story. Similarly, the non priestess tale also has got a moral. How the by the clay by clever trick, by the by the wit, he could win over the fox and he could save himself. Okay, so this is the story of Chanticleer and the hens. And in that particular story also, the Chanticleer always sees a dream. The dream is that. The, someone is going, going to eat him up. He tells his wife, Patelote, that, you know, I'm always seeing a dream. Then the wife says, you are a coward. You are a coward. Why are you getting affected by just seeing a dream? But the dream becomes a reality. And the fear he had <coughs> also, there was a reason for his fear. But because he finds that the real fox comes to his life and wants to eat him up. So the dream is also related to the reality happening in the story. So the importance of dream during the time of Chaucer is, is reflected through that poem. So this is the, this is the two poems I have discussed, uh, the Canterbury Tales and the non Priestess Tale. And everything is in old English. You have some, um, you know, it, you have some paragraphs. For example, let me read out, but you will find very difficult. When that April, when means W H A N, April A P R I W L, when that April with his sure suit, S H O U R E S, sour shoot, source S O O T E, the drote of March hath pierced to the root. So it is a very difficult English. So until and unless you understand the meaning, you will not get the poem. So even in our time, we could not study the poem because it is all in Old English. It's very difficult to understand. Of course, it is there in your book. You can always read that poem if you want to read it. But it runs to many pages. And I think I cannot give that much of time to you. Right. Next is what? Canterbury Tales and... Okay, did you get... Uh, did you understand or no? Let me get your response. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma yeah, ma'am. So from that, you can write a Canterbury Tales on prologue. You have to write on that. And second thing you have to write is about the non priestess tale that always comes. So the non priestess tale, you have to remember because it's like a story. I have told you the story of the fox and the cock. So that is the story. Next, we come to block two, and that is the Edmund Spencer. That is the age of Spencer. This is all old English, the period of medieval English. Ma'am? Yes. Excuse me. I have a yes. question, please. Yeah. Um, uh, you said to us that we have to write about the uh, uh, the Canterbury uh, Tales and uh, the Prestisto. What should we write? Is it uh, an essay or just paragraphs? No, what I told you is that first you collect the question papers. It is available on the website of IGNO. Okay. You get the question papers and see what is the pattern of questions coming. Because, you know, it is very difficult to read the entire poem to be very frank with you it is it's very impossible to read because it runs to pages and pages it will not get time for that so what you can do is just see the question papers of both the sessions uh, like jan jan and december and see what type of questions is coming from geoffrey chaucer um what short type is coming what long type is coming and if you can see that last three years question papers and both the sessions Three into two is six question papers. If you see six question papers, you can have a fair idea of what type of questions are coming. 
Yes, I already saw them, but I didn't get the idea if I have to uh, write uh, paragraphs or a whole essay with the introduction, then we have the body, then the conclusion. Yeah, if you said, depending on the mark, if you have a short note of say five marks or 10 marks, you don't have to write so much. But if it is a long question, then you have to write the introduction, then the body, then the development of everything, and a conclusion, which may run to say three to three to four pages. I see, because uh, uh, I am from Tunisia, and we have different way of uh, of uh, answering the questions. Mm -hmm. When I was at the university, we used to write an essay with an introduction. Then we have the development part. Uh, then we have the conclusion. This yeah. is why here I am confused. So uh, what should I do? Should I? No, have no, there, there, there is no year mark thing that you have to write like this. You know, this is not mathematics. This is literature. So even if you just start with an introduction and develop the entire thing with a conclusion, you don't have to say it is introduction. This is a conclusion. Is a main part of the body, main body. You know, don't have to write like it can be a total like two, three paragraphs or four paragraphs written. But it has to be a flow. It has to have a continuity of thought. It has to have some analysis of the poem you have read. You know, got my point? Yes, I got that. Uh, uh, one other question. Should we uh, focus on the structure of the poems or no. the meaning? No, you have to focus more on the uh, analysis or the, I mean, the thematic part of the poem. What the poet wants to say through that and a small paragraph on the style aspect of the poem. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, excuse me, uh, for assignments, I would like to know that uh, we have been given assignments and, uh, uh, and when we read that uh, uh, poem line, so we, 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 we do not come to know. Asana, you are not audible to me. Some disturbance is going. I am not okay. actually able to hear you. Actually, I'm on the way, I'm in the car. So, uh, can I, like, I have a question? Okay. It's, uh, can I'm I, not able to, can maybe, you? maybe if you reach a particular place and sit down and then ask me, then it will be better, because I'm not able to hear you. And now can you move? Yeah, later on, let me continue, okay? Okay, okay. So, next, we can come to the next block. And this is the Renaissance. Renaissance, you know, you have two concepts, Renaissance and Reformation. There are two concepts in English literature. One is the Renaissance. Renaissance started in Europe. And then it came to England towards the end of the 15th century. And Renaissance started because uh, maybe Mazda, she must be knowing, uh, because of the fall of Constantinople to the Turks and all these refugees who were there, they were people of great learning and they were also people who belonged to the church and they were literature, the persons of literature. So they started moving to different parts of Europe or else they would all be victimized. So they came and settled in a way in Europe. And when they started settling in Europe, naturally England being a part of Europe, that it, that thing was also felt, the effect of Renaissance was also felt in England. So when this, uh, during this, uh, uh, you can say the uh, end of the 15th or the early uh, 16th century, things have started developing progressing you can say why because of the verse learning and literature and why this learning because the printing press had been invented by gutenberg so when the printing press was invented naturally all these classical languages french latin spanish all these classical languages you know got translated into english so people had an opportunity to read this new learning, this new uh, type of uh, um, this thing so called, you can say the wisdom, new wisdom. 
and different concepts came into the fore. For example, there was a famous person called educationist. He was called Erasmus. Erasmus, and he's he had a great impact. Literature had a great impact on him. So he started the concept of humanism. So there was no concept of humanism. I know having empathy, having love, all these things were not there because it was a time of conflict. And it was people are suffering, people are uneducated. So now with this learning, people migrating from Constantinople to, uh, to and settling in different parts of Europe, and they're all men of learning, they also brought the wisdom along with them. And that had a great impact on the society in Europe and also in England. So there was a rise of humanism. So this humanism had a concept where you know they were people uh, they, it, they, 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 they they thought that it is society where where all human beings are related to each other there's no sort of hierarchy that i am a serf or i am a may i am a slave so he's my master so i am bonded to him so all this concept you know started getting eroded and there was a rise of humanism and is a fraternity. When you have humanism, there's a sense of fraternity among the people also. And Erasmus was the man who had this impact, great impact on literature and on the art in England. And at the same time, you know, there were translations from French, Italian, Latin, and they were made into English. And again, you will find there was a rise of Protestantism in Christianity, one is the Catholics, one is the Protestantism. So the Catholics had dominated because Rome, the Catholic Church being in Rome, so they had they were dominating. But Protestants were the people who were people with progressive ideas. They believed in, they did not believe in this community worship. They did not believe in that whatever the uh, father says or whatever the priest says is the final thing. You know, they believed in the individual worship. They started reasoning out. They started reflecting. So there were two groups. One was Protestantism. One was this Catholics. And as a result of Protestantism, the Anglican Church was there. One was the Catholic Church. And this is the Anglican Church, which was the effect of Protestant, Protestantism, and that is how the Anglican Church moved away from the Roman Church, or you can say the Catholic Church. So they wanted to have their own religion. They wanted to have their own, uh, their, you know, their own uh, philosophy. So there are a lot of reforms which took place in the church, or you can say the ecclesiastical world. You call the ecclesiastical world, where all these wrong practices uh, were you know, the father was given too much of importance. He had a particular way of wearing the dress that was more important than his philosophy. So all this was not given any importance. And the Bible became important, not that man. The Bible, the book became important. So the Roman papacy or the Roman church, there was a breakaway from that Roman church. And that was the time the great leader martin luther you must have heard he was a black man uh, martin luther he came with very progressive ideas and he fought openly against the corrupt practices of the church because the church by that time due to the supremacy of the fathers due to the supremacy of these uh, uh, you know this uh, um, you can say this catholic the, the priests in the church Whatever they said, it was the final word for others. So they had started having this all these corrupt practices in the church. So Martin Luther protested directly and vehemently, and as a leader. And also he was even he was also killed. You can say he was killed because uh, because of this protest. You can say so. These translations took place, and the first translation made into English was by Wycliffe. So now the English society started reorganizing because there was no sort of society in uh, England, you can say. But now due to these thinkers, due to this printing press, due to the spread of education and due to the growth of power in London as a, as a commercial power, 
this cities developed the urbanization developed and there were a lot of you know artisans uh, crafts also developed and court poets also flourished there was a court where i think uh, um who was the king at that time i think uh, i think it, it was it uh, who was the king the king of england uh, okay so he the court poets they flourished and now earlier religion was a part of the state i mean wh whatever the church said it was the final word so church was dominating religion was dominating but now you find religion and state they became different religious people were confined to churches and they were only involved in religious practices but they had no role about the state politics and there was a growth of england as a naval and a command commercial power lot of industries also came so this was the time when edmund spencer as a poet became very famous and what was famous about what is the importance of uh, uh, spencer because he had written a number of poems of course but his he was famous for his sonnets spencerian sonnets which spoke about love sensuality sexuality all these things were not you know spoken earlier because of the church it was a taboo love was not expressed openly because of the church but now with this reforms church reforms people had started thinking freely they started expressing their opinion gave went to expressing their ideas so that is how the sonnet form also became very popular and sonnet is something where it is a vehicle it's it's where is a vehicle it become the vehicle of expressing of love and sensuality so he wrote a number of sonnets out of that amority sonnets was very famous and then that he was written the sonnet 34 67 it is there but in all his sonnets will find that there lot of biblical allusions allusions means references he has given lot of references to the bible because from the bible you know they were getting the ideas that was the main book for their christians so biblical allusions and also mythology because there are lot of translations from latin from french and other you know languages so where you know find the the, the especially the greeks where mythology is very famous with the greek people you know so mythology also played its role and in his poems we'll find that the poet is more like a lover and he he expresses love for the lady that is the general uh, struck i mean the voice of uh, spencer and also there's a note of complaint that uh, the lady is not responding or the lady you know so all these things are there judge which is all the you know varieties of expressions of love so mostly he focused on sonnets he had a sonnet form and he spoke about love for the first time love was expressed through poet spencer so spencer yeah this in those english nationalism you know i told you that english become nationalistic feeling uh, fervor was there in england because england grew as a naval and a commercial power and there's a burgeoning economy economy was also developing and the rise of the rich class also happened so spencer was he read his initial years he spent in cambridge he was a very great scholar and he had read lot of he was an avid reader he learnt read lot of uh, the classical um, works virgil um enid and uh, you know this uh, homer 
all this he had read and that is how he got his ideas but at the same time he had a christian orientation he had a very good friend called philip sidney so he had he was also a poet and spencer in most of his life you can he was a court poet he was a court poet he was in the court of of the king and he was a court poet and with the help of education and he was a very social person he had acquired a lot of contacts so he was also a very popular poet of his time <clears throat> so the poems you have i find is the amoriti sonnets you have where he talks about the beloved he talks about love with the biblical allusions and in spencer you find the mistress responds to the love of the lover and it is in in the sonnet form petrarch in the, the first act, octave sister that that sosta sister that pattern he writes his sonnet and it is about the courtly the love he expressed was very refined sort of love a courtly love you know that time of love is not that uh, the the way nowadays we have you know it is not love it is a sort of you can say too much of uh, you can say the earlier love and the modern love as we find see today there is a lot of difference there was a dignity in the love if you read john kits you know john kits's love letters it was there in our ma course if you ever read that book love letters of kits you will see how a love letter is written with so much of dignity with so much of style with so much of poise but nowadays you know love has become so cheap it is more like a commodity you know that sense of dignity he is totally lost in love so that type of love was something different it was more a courtship it was not love it was a courtship like falling for someone praising someone praising the beloved and the beloved in the early stages not responsive but at the at the last you'll find the lady's response to the love of the lover so that is how the the love was so his two famous poems were <coughs> epithalamian epithalamian and prothalamian epithalamian and prothalamian epithalamian means it is a, again a, a wedding song and the meaning of epithalamian means bridal chamber where the song is sung in celebration of the bride's wedding night so it, it is a description of the wedding night because spencer had married elizabeth sorry for interrupting ma'am please don't i am continuing don't have to disturb me now yeah but there are students who are trying to get in no one is letting them in yes there are yes. some students who who are about to to who want to to join the class but no one is letting them in no one is letting them in yes okay. how do i find that tell them let them in i'll i'll allow them there are 112 students are fine now all right thanks i'll tell them 112 students are there i don't know i think everyone is in not everyone not everyone yeah because my class my class is is is, is telling me on my whatsapp group that they are not Uh, they, they are unable to come in okay but i don't see anything where i can allow them to come classroom 2 but they are so men time out and in but they what has he written but they so is the time now over i have not seen the time is my time over half an hour left ma'am half an hour is left yeah hello ma'am No, my my time was two to three. No, <laughs> I have exceeded half an hour. <laughs> I have exceeded half an hour. Can you share your slide with us? Because we cannot see the slide. No, I don't have the slides because if I do the slides, I will not focus on whatever. I will just show you the slides. You know, you will not understand. I have to make you understand. I can show you the slides, but you will not understand until I explain them. So by the time, because I am covering two two blocks at one time. Okay. and these are very wrong blocks if i go on focusing on the slides you will not understand because i am talking about the cultural background and the social background all these together to have a slide 
it goes in explaining in the slides, it, I, I cannot cover, you know, that will take long time for me. Okay, please. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I told you these wrote two poems. One is prothalamine, epithalamine, and the other one is prothalamine. And epithalamine is a famous, is a, is a, it's like a bridal chamber, the night, wedding night, where the where the where he talks about the bride, he talks about sensuality, he talks about the wish to have a sexual union with the uh, of the of the married couple, and it is also it, it has elements of eroticism, and and that is and this is about. Uh, epithalamian but if it is prothalamian it is on one one is epi and the other one is pro prothalamian is like epithalamian but there is no erotic element there is no erotic element in prothalamian it is just a it is description of a wedding procession of two girls getting married getting married and uh, it is the daughter of widowed edward somers somerset all of her sister where these two girls are getting married. So this is just a description of the bridal procession. And they, these two girls are compared to two beautiful swans who are walking along the river Thames. So there's a pastoral sitting and, and it is about this wedding. So this, these two are wedding songs, you can say. And it talks about the, the it's a, it, it just talks about fusion, fusion of, uh, the Christian ideas, beliefs, and also talks about the uh, this uh, local flow folklore as they go in the wedding. So all these are explained in the poem, and it, so it's a beautiful, you can say, uh, fusion, uh, blending of the Christian and the classical tradition, and also it is reflects its poet's personal uh, happiness over the union because he was also get he celebrates his marriage to elizabeth he had married so it is a reflection of his own happiness and his own sexual desire and between the bride and the groom that has been reflected so this epithalamine has got 24 stanzas it has got a very long poem 365 long lines 365 so it, it talks about the universe, it talks about the temporal, it talks about divine love, it talks about earthly love, it talks about platonic love. So different ideas have been fused into the poem. But if you take it together, it is about the celebration of a marriage, celebration of a wedding night and erotic elements and a fusion of sexuality and sensuality that has been reflected in the poem. And Prothalavindiman is a wedding point about the wedding procession that goes and about the two girls of the earl getting married so these are the two poems and usually you have short notes on prothalamian prothalamian and epithalamian so these are the two things you have uh, which comes in the uh, examination so today i think i will end here and if you find time you go through the sonnets have a look at the sonnets because the orals, you, these uh, names are very unfamiliar to you. Until you see them, until you write them, you'll not remember the spellings, correct spelling. Because when I correct the copies, I find a lot of spelling mistakes are happening. Because you are not able to write the correct spelling of the protagonist or of the poem or of the poet or of the characters. So please write the names, remember them correctly. Then only you can you know, fare well in your examination. Okay, ma'am. Right. Excuse me. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, we didn't have um, English honors in BA, so can you please uh, give us the idea how to write the assignment? How can I give you the idea of assignment in two assignment, minutes? Uh, writing assignments means how to write uh, in both of the paper. Can can we write uh, both of the A4 size plain paper? No, if you are writing assignment, depends on the question. How? What is the num mark of the question? Question uh, number 20. 20. Number one, one ma'am, jo uh, poem. Tiger, oh, tiger. What is the total mark given for the assignment? Ma'am, um, uh, actually there are five questions to attend for in one assignment. Like uh, for Meg one, there are five questions. Uh, first one is a compulsory question, I guess. And yeah. another uh, yeah. four questions we have to choose. Each question carries yeah. 20 marks. And how know, to write that one question? Like, say, for yeah. example, 
uh, how many page uh, we should write that one question no, like uh, sorry, totally for how many page an assignment excuse me literature is not you know doesn't go by pages you can write one two pages but it should be meaningful if you write number of pages that doesn't mean we are not like you know that weighing machine that will weigh the number of pages and accordingly give you marks if you like trash and write nothing 10 pages you may write but you'll just get 10 marks but if you write uh, something substantial uh, yeah ma'am but uh, we want to know the uh, minimum uh, ma'am minimum actually we want to know pages. the limit minimum. actually the minimum two and a half pages okay two and ah, half okay ma'am two and a half pages is the minimum you can write but don't what? make it very the, the more you write the more you make mistakes let me tell you the more you write the more you make mistakes so you have to be very comprehensive in your ideas okay. And you have to write the gist. Go on, don't go on repeating the same idea because you have a habit of repeating. Okay. Uh, ma'am, I want to ask you something. Thank you. Firstly, okay. I want to thank you, ma'am, for being so quick and giving us a brief insight into both the logs today. Thank you so much for that, and you took extra time also. Secondly, I would like to ask you, like somebody else was just asking, there is a question that talks about they have given us excerpts from the poem. So if we are given those excerpts, yeah. what all do we like? Yeah. You have talked about thematic and everything. Yeah. Everything needs to be included in uh, in the explanation. No, yeah, yeah. If, no, let me. If there's an excerpt, then first in the first uh, paragraph, you have to write that this is called from this, this poem or uh, about little about that poet. If it is Spencer, you can write little about the poet, about the era, okay. from the age he has come. Little about the poet, not his biography, where he was born, where he had his education. Please don't write that. But you have to just write about little about the poet. Okay. And then from the, 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 as you are having an excerpt, you have to have the main concept of the poem that in this poem he's celebrating about uh, the, the, the happiness of marriage on that. In this context, he wants to say this, 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 this. Okay. So first, the whole overview of the entire poem, the meaning of the entire poem, you have to just write in four, three to four lines or maybe five lines. Then okay. you come to the context. First is the general background. Then you come to the context of your excerpt about what he wants to write and then okay. and toward the end of the uh, your writing you have to mention a little about the style of the poet if you know uh, okay. if it is a sonnet or if he uses this simile if he uses this thing if that thing whatever it is what are the stylistic aspects of the poem if you know you can reflect on that okay thank you so much ma'am and if i would request you whenever you are explaining to us the, these blogs could you please give us an insight actually how to answer that is i think the major pro issue because we don't know much about it we just like you just explained as to you know how we have to go about to how many lines to spend uh, no i i would have writing. i would have happily i would have happily gone but you know my time is so limited you know i had to just I have to run through to cover I the understand, or else you know, really very quick and it actually for a person who is i though I, I do know a little bit of this don't know much i have been reading since some time and know a little bit but still i think it's a long way to go might not be able to do everything before the exam so mm -hmm. uh, just uh, banking upon your uh, uh, maybe it keeps us motivated to kind of finish it in time and sit for the exam okay it's fine thank you so much i think you thank just you, know the, yeah go just remember the features of the age more important the features of the age once you know the features of the age what is the cage characteristics of the age accordingly you can apply that to the poet you know that is how we we develop the answer okay thank you so okay. much ma'am thanks a lot okay, ma okay thank you see you tomorrow uh, okay uh, yes ma'am tomorrow I'll uh ma'am i just had a doubt regarding protestantism and uh, anglicanism I always get a little confused mm -hmm. uh, between the two. So could you just explain? No, Anglicanism, no, it's Anglican church. No, Anglican is a church, not Anglicanism. Protestantism, okay. Catholicism. Okay, these are the two groups. And when they moved away from the Catholic church in England, they established the Anglican church. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, okay.
Those who are fast up go, it's not a phone in that go. Otherwise, we will make uh, another group and uh, we all add on that group. Who is missing the group? Please uh, let me in. Who is missing the group? Please, who have a group, uh, send us uh, that link to join in that group. Uh, otherwise, we will make another group. Those have group, can you join, join us? Those who have already made the group, can you add us? Hello, can you add me? There, there is a link. There's a link sent on the group on the message. That's the uh, WhatsApp group link. Maybe if you click on it, you can join the group there. I think so. The link Hello. is. I joined. I joined the group. Hello, this is Aditi Sinha. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. The link is the link is not working. It's failing 